Iceland is a wild country with thousands of waterfalls, active geysers, thermal hot springs, lava fields, and more dramatic landscape than you can possibly imagine. The perfect environment to field test the brand new Nikon D850. Throughout this three week trip, I'm going to be leading a two week tour in the south, west and north of the country, hitting some of the major hotspots, as well as visiting some of Iceland's famous animals that have never been crossbred since the Vikings. Welcome to a new series where we take tech on the road, explore a travel destination and test the gear out in real life. This is Field Tested. The island of Iceland has just over 300,000 inhabitants. It's relatively sparse, but jam-packed with unbelievable landscapes. It's one of the newest countries on Earth and one of the most geothermically active with geysers and hot springs and active volcanoes throughout the country. So let's take a look around the D850. Comparing it to the D810, they've upgraded the CF to XQD. So this now, like the D500, uses XQD and UHS SD cards. The sensor has probably the biggest upgrade. We're talking 45.7 megapixels, almost 10 megapixels up from the D810, and it's backlight illuminated. So it'll be interesting to see how the high ISO performs. It's now recording full 4K video up to 30 frames per second and it's got an articulated screen. And one thing a lot of people are excited about, this will do seven frames a second with the internal battery or up to nine if you add the grip. So now let's jump into the trip. On day two of our tour, we headed down south to the beautiful area of Vic, famous for its basalt columns and black sandy beach. The beautiful frothy white water makes for a dramatic contrast from the black sand. And it's quite famous. You might recognize it from loads of different TV shows and movies. The day we visited was really wild weather and the D850's weather ceiling was put to the test with rapid wind and rain right beside the beach. So any bad seals would have really picked it up. But thankfully there was no issues at all. I even almost submerged it as I was doing a long exposure right at the water, but touch wood, everything survived just fine. The geyser in southern Iceland is really something beautiful to observe whether you're a photographer or not. It goes off approximately every five to seven minutes with the buildup of pressure shooting a plume of water straight up into the sky. It's a great test for the responsiveness of your camera to see how many frames you can get off in the explosion time. And it's equally beautiful shooting from above here filmed with the Mavic. The buffer seemed to fill up quicker than I expected. Nikon claimed that this will do 51 shots in full 14-bit RAW to the buffer. So I've got the faster speed XQD in here, 440 megabytes per second. I'm writing RAW to that. And then I'm writing JPEG to 300 megabyte per second SD card. Now I'm doing 14-bit lossless compressed, so they're smaller file types. But let's see if we can get to 51 before this craps out. That was about 21 before it's completely slowed down to unusable. And I'm sorry, but this is not an acceptable buffer reaction. So let's actually try it. I'll let that completely clear to the card and then I'll do it at 14 bit uncompressed and see if it could actually be the X-Speed processor that's slowing it down. Okay, so it's finished writing to the card. I'm now doing 14 bit uncompressed raw just to the XQD. Let's see how many we get. Twenty and struggle city. Okay, so they say 51 in 14 bit, and I think it was something like 150 or 170 if you're doing 12 bit. Let's try that. 12 bit raw only, straight to the XQD. Twenty-eight. 
that's still less than 30. And keep in mind, this is doing seven frames a second, the best you can do using the standard battery. Once you have the grip, that's likely to, well, you're probably gonna get the same number of shots, but you'll get the even faster doing nine frames a second. So if you're doing, say, a 100 meter final where you're getting seven or nine frames a second, your buffer's filling up in three seconds, and then you're missing the whole rest of the race. That really could be an issue. Most people wouldn't be buying this as a sports camera, but there's so much conjecture out there that this is the one camera to do everything. You wanna keep that in mind if you're doing anything that requires a big buffer. The Thingvellir National Park in Iceland is another big tourist hotspot. It's located where the two tectonic plates have started to move apart and create a rift. The resulting little valleys and chasms have some of the clearest water in the world, famous now for their diving because they have longer visibility by about two or three times than just about anywhere else on Earth. It's really an amazing place to see the Earth physically growing, the whole rift have Having emerged over the last few thousand years. The lava fields in Iceland are really something special, just miles and miles as far as the eye can see of rocky rolling hills of dried up lava, magma that came from the volcano Kutla eruption generations ago. It's actually due to go off anytime soon again. Over the top of the lava is a radiant green moss that takes decades to grow, but then forms a really beautiful shell for what otherwise would be a black rocky field. No surprise that Iceland has a lot of ice. It has some of the biggest glaciers in all of Europe. And we visited one Calvin glacier that is, you know, pushing down towards the sea, but it's receded over 50 meters in the last year. At the current rate, it's only going to be a few decades before the entire glacier has melted into the sea. The Glacier Lagoon is a tourist hotspot, but for good reason. It's absolutely beautiful seeing these giant icebergs floating in the lagoon. As they wash down out towards the shore, there's beautiful photo opportunities to get the sea coming in and out, the tide washing around the different shaped icebergs. And it's really interesting to see the different colors and shapes that come out of these big blocks of ice. Okay, folks, I'm currently at the biggest waterfall in Iceland. As you've seen through this series, the weather in Iceland is really extreme. It goes from sunny to raining to just total downpours to fog in a matter of seconds. And I have to say to its credit, the D850 hasn't skipped a beat at all. The battery has been doing well, really, really well. Even using the SnapBridge to transmit the GPS data from my phone all day, it lasts at least until about 6 p.m. even if I'm shooting like a thousand shots that day and when I've done long time lapses of like 1200 images they've also all run off a single one of the batteries. In terms of weather sealing, well so far so good. I've shot in all of the conditions with no real concern. I use my lens cloth to keep the front of the lens clean and before I open the lens or change cards or anything, back to the bus and totally wipe it down with a towel to make sure it's nice and dry. Having said that, someone else on my tour with a D850 was a victim of a careless tourist who was running past at the beach, kicked his tripod into the water and the camera was kaput instantly. So good for lots of wind and drizzly rain in my one-off experience, not good for full immersion. The Husavel Valley is just gorgeous and home to my favorite waterfall in all of Iceland. Here, the natural water seeps through the lava rocks and comes down as if it's kind of emerging from the wall of Earth. It's a really beautiful waterfall and a short walk up the path reveals some really fast moving rapids, which are great for getting some slightly longer exposures. Here was my first opportunity to take advantage of the D850's built-in intervalometer to take a series of shots to get different amounts of movement in the water. 
Now, a lot of people know that the Icelandic horses are unique for several reasons. One, they have some unusual gaits, but two, they've never been crossbred. They were brought over by the Norwegians in Viking times, and when the country was cut off, they were never mixed with different kinds of horses. But the same is true of a lot of their livestock, including cows and sheep and goats. As we were visiting a lady famous for raising the Icelandic goats, I happened to stop in a year ago and went back to her barn and found again that she had a new litter of little kittens, which then distracted me for a good hour, but no regrets. Shooting inside the barn was a great opportunity to check out the low light capabilities of the D850. I have to say the focus was still surprisingly good. A definite step up from the D810 and following only behind the D5 in low light focusing. Having said that, the ISO performance, I don't really see any improvement over the D810. Considering the jump in resolution, the fact that it's about the same is actually a pretty good result. I still personally want to shoot this as low as I possibly can right down at ISO 64 if possible. I'd be comfortable up to 8 or 1200 if needs be, but once you're getting over 1600, certainly up to around 6400, I'm not happy with the results and the white balance just starts to go crazy sometimes. Now it's certainly true that with a super high res sensor you want to be careful of your shutter speed to avoid any little movements that could blur your final shot. But for these ones of the seals, I popped my camera on a tripod, it was at 400mm, and fired off shots around a second in duration trying to get the water blurred out, and with luck trying to get the animals staying still for that period of time. Some of them worked out. I think every photographer who visits Iceland has their fingers crossed they're going to see the Northern Lights. Unfortunately, it's really just a crapshoot. It depends on a lot of things. You need the, the activity to be happening in the sky, which you can monitor, but you can't really predict ahead of time. And then you need a cloud-free night. Now we do time this tour to try and coincide to have the best chance for it, but it really just comes down to a bit of luck. On our fourth night in the country, we got lucky and there was a strong amount of aurora in the sky and we got an opening in the clouds. This was when the D850's silent intervalometer really came into its own, being able to set up a series of images. I just told it to take 1200 shots six seconds apart for five second exposures. I left it on silent shooting and then I was able to just lay on the ground and really enjoy and immerse myself in this amazing natural phenomena rather than fiddling with settings or worrying about my external intervalometer freezing up in the cold weather. Likewise, the focus stacking feature works really simply. You just set it up, tell it how many shots you want to take and in what increment, and it will move the focus for you. Of course, then you need to go into software in post and actually stack the image together yourself. I've done a standalone tutorial on that. You can check out the card above. Small changes to the D850 make it much more user friendly than the D810. A small thing that I never really thought much about, but having the articulated screen really is useful in getting creative shots down close to the ground. The ground is almost always wet in Iceland, so if you can get the camera down low, but stay off your knees or off your stomach to be able to see the viewfinder, it really makes a difference. This composition on the famous black church in Helna was only possible right down close to the ground and I was able to stay clean whilst doing it so that's a big plus for me. Towards the end of our trip, we made it all the way up to the north of Iceland to Husavik, an area that's famous for whale watching and has some of Europe's best whale spotting opportunities all year round. We headed out in a rib boat, a really fast inflatable boat, and we were quite lucky to see several humpback whales up nice and close. It was my first time shooting this. I have to say, I don't think my shots were up to the standard that I was hoping for. Timing, you know, getting them just as they breached. We didn't have any actually jump out of the water, so it was more the tail shot, but it was a fantastic experience to be so close to these giant animals. Up until about 100 years ago, most Icelandic people lived in these traditional turf houses that used a good foot of earth and grass for insulation. Taking a look around the his historic one, it was really quite interesting. 
Even though it was confined spaces, it was actually quite warm and you could see how that would be an advantage through their crazy winter. Just nearby there was a grove of big mushrooms growing and I thought this is a great example to demonstrate the amazing dynamic range the D850 has. Here there was no way that you could get everything exposed in one frame. But here if we pull the exposure down we can get the sky and if we push it way 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 up we can start to see the inside of the mushroom itself. So much latitude in these files. Morning folks at sunrise in northwestern Iceland now I've come up for a horse muster where the farmers bring their wild Icelandic horses down from the pasture after six months roaming the wild, corral them and then get them back to the farms. This is going to be my last chance to test out the D850 here and I'm going to be focusing on focus acquisition speed and tracking as they bring the horses down the hill. Okay folks, so the wind has picked up a lot. There's a horse about to bite my tripod. Oh my God, its head is like 10 times the size of the camera. This isn't gonna end well. Hey buddies, hey. So this place is spectacular. It's so calm. We're just by a couple of rivers in the middle of the mountains and the horses are so engaging and gentle and sweet. At first they kind of are a little bit skittish but then they all just want to crowd around you and the difficulty of shooting them then becomes not them walking away but all coming towards you and you end up with like a dozen of them circled around you. For grab shots, you know, trying to isolate animals, I was using the 105 and the 70 to 200. I was also using the 15 to 30 whilst they were up close to get some different vantage points. Here's a couple of the shots. As usual, you can jump on over to mattgranger.com forward slash field tested and check out some of the full res files there. And also, whilst you're there, do click through and check out our sponsors, Lens Pro to Go, Soundstripe, and Lightify, who are all making this series of field tested possible. The horses are just about to come down the mountain, so let's head back out. Okay folks, so the horse roundup was spectacular. I'm now doing another loop around the Golden Circle with my wife here at Golfos Waterfall and I want to give you my final thoughts on the D850. And yes, I will tell you what I think of it specifically head to head with the D810. But note, I haven't put them side by side, but I used the D810 for years, hundreds of thousands of frames, so I know it inside out. Off the bat, the D850 is phenomenal. I can't recommend it highly enough. It is expensive at $3,300, but I expected it to be more. That's the same price the D810 was years ago, and it has some significant improvements over that. That's not to say that you necessarily need this over the D810. If you don't need the video, you don't need the extra resolution, you might get by without it. But this does have some important usability features that really elevate it. I didn't think I would use it much, but the intervalometer built in in silent mode is really great. I shot a couple of thousand frames and not having the shutter mechanism going off, increasing your actuation and wearing it out is great. And it also means that it's silent. In addition to that, the focus stacking mode, it does work. Just keep in mind, you have to stack it yourself later. It just takes the photos for you. If you have a lens that has significant focus breathing, it makes it a little bit more difficult. But if you're into that kind of thing, it could be a really important and useful feature for you. The video is the best on any Nikon camera so far, full frame, uh, 4K. The image quality coming off it is really nice. Almost all the B-roll that wasn't from the Air or from a GoPro was taken with this guy, just with me hand holding it. And I think it did a really nice job. The sensor is 
phenomenal. It's the best sensor Nikon's ever put out, in my opinion. Overall, I think this is the best digital camera Nikon has ever put out, and it's now my favorite. That doesn't mean that it's perfect. Things that are astounding. The resolution is great, but you do need to be careful of your shutter speed. The color, I think, is the nicest and richest and most natural of any Nikon DSLR. I didn't find that green hue that's common to a lot of Nikon DSLRs. The ISO, I don't think it's any better than the D810, to be honest. This has a serious bump in megapixels, so that's not a huge surprise. But, you know, I tend to shoot under ISO 800 wherever possible in any case. The bump in speed over the D810 is noticeable and really useful. Having said that, and I've said this in a previous video, the focus acquisition and tracking is not as good as the D5, but hey, this isn't a sports camera. I know some people wanna think that this can do everything the best in the market, it doesn't, but it does a lot of things best in the market and everything else right up there with the best, If, but you know, the D5 is still ahead. Dual card slots are great, but even the XQD can't keep up with this guy on burst mode, let alone when you throw the grip on, it's going to suffer from buffer issues where it just can't clear the buffer in time. The tilty screen and touch screen, really great for getting shots down low to the ground. I'm a bit of an old fuddy-duddy and like a fixed screen, but the tilty screen, it's working fantastically well. I do miss not having a pop-up flash. I know a lot of people frown upon using it, but it is great for adding a bit of fill sometimes. And it's also really, really handy for triggering external strobes. So for me, that is a bit of a bummer that that's lost. But overall, the ergonomics on this are great. The build quality is great. The ceiling, well, I've put it through all kinds of conditions and it hasn't skipped a beat. Having said that, one of my tour participants had his kicked into the ocean and completely died so it's not superhuman. But for showers and stuff, I didn't find any problems with it. I, there's not much more I can really say. It's a phenomenally good camera. I can really understand why it's getting so much hype. If you don't need those upgrades though, the D810 is still a superb camera, but other than the pop-up flash, I don't think there's any way that it's superior to this. It's still great, but this is super extra great. Really enjoyed shooting with this guy. Let me know what you thought of this field tested video and please do check out Lens Pro to go, Lutify and Soundstripe so you can see what they're providing. They've made this whole series of field tested possible. So big thanks to them and thanks to you for watching. Do like and subscribe and I'll see you soon.